Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Merdad Mizani. Welcome, Merdad. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. And uh, Merdad was recommended well over a year ago by an old friend of mine whom I knew back in the early 70s. And, you know, she was really raving about you and saying you're a wonderful guy and all that. And so I listened to some of your YouTube recordings and found them to be very delightful. And then, you know, in that I'm inundated with requests to interview people and recommendations and so on. It wasn't until just recently that I finally thought, darn it, I gotta invite Merdad and, and just, you know, do it. It's been too long that I've kept him waiting. So I might say by by you know, to anyone who's listening who's been requested an interview or recommended an interview, please bear with me. I only do one a week and I receive invitations and recommendations every day and it's hard to prioritize them, but I'll get to everyone eventually. <clears throat> yeah, I think you did great. Yeah. You're doing great. Okay, good. All is well and wisely put. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good. So why don't we start by just having you tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, what would you like to know? Well, you know, a lot of times when you speak, when I interview someone, they have a kind of a teaching, you know, stuff they like to say to people. And, mm. pe and if you just start right out with that, people think, well, you know, what are this guy's credentials? What, how is it that he's able to say, is there any sort of authority or experience behind his words, or has he just read a few good books, you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> well, authority, I don't know, but experience, for sure. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, where should I start? Um, well, uh, are you from, where are you from, Iran? Yes. Okay. Do yes. uh, you know Ellie Ruzdar that I interviewed? Very lovely lady. She lives up on Long Island, and I've interviewed her twice. Yes, she, she's yes, also from I, Iran. Yeah, I saw both of them. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Yes, I was born in Iran, and uh, uh, at this moment, maybe I don't go so much detail into my uh, childhood experiences. Yeah, so. Just whatever you think is really germane to the conversation here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. The the events of my childhood definitely had a strong impact on me. And uh, it it somehow put me on a path to find out answers, uh, to find out why the events happened the way they did. And uh, my education has been just a, a normal education. And I went to the music school, and I graduated from a music school, got my diploma. I played. Uh, uh, classical music and modern music both in the symphony orchestra and the rock bands and so on. Oh cool, guitar? Uh, piano. Piano, okay. Yes. And then during this whole time uh, I was constantly searching. Uh, this was almost like out of my control just to find out more and more uh, answers. And it was all related actually to my childhood. So even though the events were not so pleasant or ideal, but for some reason, I'm grateful that they happened. So <laughs> it led me to to find the answers. And of course, like everyone else, uh, I wanted to find out why things happened. Uh, why am I here? Why are we here? Who are we? Who am I? <coughs> and then. In a course of search, I came across a lot of answers, and finally, <coughs> excuse me, I realized that um, this thing that is called truth, that everyone is looking for, trying to find, is, has always existed. We just come to situations in our lives that we uh, look for them, and eventually we discover. So therefore, it's nothing that is invented, but it's just discovered, and based on everyone's personal experience, is explained in a little bit maybe different words. Mm -hmm. But at the root, all the truth that has ever been spoken by anyone, old and new, is all the same at the very foundation of it, of who we are, why are we here, and what's the reason that we should be you know, connected to each other. Mm -hmm. So... <clears throat> I don't know if this is enough about me, or do you have any more questions, detail? I well, um, had you moved over to the U.S. by that time, or were you still in Iran when you were... Oh, you know? I left Iran in 1974, uh -huh. and I went to Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, I was in Europe for about 10 years. 
I traveled in Europe. I was in England, Germany, France. Okay. Then uh, I moved to U United States in 1985. Okay. So I've been here for a while. Mm. I spent three months in Iran myself back uh, mm. just just before the Shah left. Mm -hmm. uh, I was with a meditation group, and we were trying to create peace in the atmosphere by all meditating together in groups. And it was kind of a wild experience. Um, so, uh, okay, so you you came to the conclusion that everything, all the great mystery traditions and and truth speakers throughout the world are essentially ultimately saying the same thing. Um, was that kind of a uh, more of a philosophical insight, or had you been doing some kind of practices or something to give some experiential verification to that idea? I I did a lot of study, mm -hmm. and uh, I also made many many mistakes in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, sometimes I thought I'm a kind of person that I have to make all the mistakes, and there's no more mistakes to be made. <laughs> to start the, my final thing. <laughs> yeah. And so. I learned a lot from my own mistakes uh, about my perspective, about myself, about people, relationships, and uh, <clears throat> as I said, I did study, I learned uh, through reading a lot of books, uh, traveling, uh, conversations with people, mm -hmm. and I think more than anything else, now when I look back, I can see that there's this... Uh, beautiful accommodating energy exists in life that for the ones who begin to search whether consciously or unconsciously there's a lot of support mm. things happens and uh, people you meet events will happen books appear so to speak and then you read them and then there are for for my special need for my special special search then uh, I would find uh, answers and conclusions in the different places that would help me along the way to clarify things. Mm, that's a nice point. I've I've spoken to people who've actually you know literally had books fall off the shelf. You know, in bookstores, they'll they'll be walking down the aisle and plop, a book will fall out, and it'll be exactly what they need. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. It uh, I. I'm now so glad to see uh, the things that a lot of time people say, oh, what a coincidence, mm. uh, oh, it was a miracle, it was a magic. I um, now have no doubt that actually the, the real life, the life, uh, is all full of magic and miracle. These coincidences are actually every moment, as long as I'm in line with it, as long as I'm in tune with it, so to speak. Yeah. That's well, it, it kind of points to an underlying principle, doesn't it? I mean, if if these things are not coincidence, then who or who or what is actually orchestrating things such that we find the right book or meet the right person or you know, there seems to be some larger intelligence that's um cognizant of our motivation, you know. And if if we if we somehow begin to seek then you know circumstances begin to organize themselves and you know at first it, we might not think about that but after a while you think whoa you know what is this intelligence that is helping me out here you know there's something and you know some people interpret it as a guardian angel or whatever but it really seems to be much more omniscient than that that is true that is true because um, one thing I realized about this whole course that there were things in me uh, habits, uh, uh, systems of thoughts, technically we can call it programs, that I begin to see that they were dysfunctional, they were simply wrong. My perspectives, behavior, and I can put them all together as like a series of habits that has been unconsciously established due to the events and experiences, right or wrong, you know, but, but to me it was right and to me it made sense and I was going with this wrong program for a long time and habits. So <clears throat> the more I became free of those, mm. somehow uh, the very life that I was, the, because like my simple conclusion that we are 
all expression manifestation of this power that's called life mm -hmm. whatever name you know God is one name intelligence is another name whatever name but there is a life which is undeniable that is sustaining you and I and entire universe and everything and in such a magnificent way is I mean every book that we pick up about the function of our own body or the universe or the things around us it's just like after reading one or two pages you just can't help to wonder how yeah, yeah. <laughs> the way our heart works the way we breathe the way even we can see and hear and it's far more magical than we can ever even imagine so it is true that this is all one connecting principle and I found out that the fundamental nature of it is a giving, accommodating, providing, and based on that comes all these things that we call help. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. So l let me clarify what you just said. Um, yeah. you, the giving, providing bit. You, are you saying that by virtue of you giving and providing, then help is reciprocated, or are you just saying that that fundamental nature of life, whatever we want to call it, has a giving? tendency exactly yeah yeah okay and when I become more free of my own mind made uh, uh -huh. constructed perspective of life the more I become free of those the more in some way I become in tune or synchronized and then I'll be able to receive and accept those so I don't need to be so much in control uh, it was another thing I realized that in a, in a mind made life I have to be in control otherwise things falls apart mm. you know the, whereas uh, when I let go then I can see that a lot of things just, just falls into right place mm. uh, it's, it's not so easy to describe this but it's something that when you experience and everybody experiences this, just maybe more or less. I was just going to say the very same thing, that I think people can understand that because we all do, at least most everybody. I'm sure there's a certain spectrum of the population that wouldn't even get what you're saying. But, but you know, anyone who's reasonably awake does experience just what you're saying. It's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah. And for some people, uh, it might happen because they reach the end of the line. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, last night, I was with a group of people and talking about this very thing that we, I think we were watching the movie Peaceful Warrior. Which is <laughs> which I've seen it, yeah. Yeah, bring this point out that, you know, someone goes with their own habits and mind-made thoughts and perspectives and standards of reference until it doesn't work anymore. And sometimes it's actually come to a destructive point, mm -hmm. brings us completely to a standstill or cause us an illness or fall badly and so on. At that point, some people then said, maybe there is another way. Maybe my thoughts and habits and perspectives are not correct. Because the weight of the wrong eventually will bring its own path down. It can no wrong can go long, you know, it, it eventually fall down by its own weight. Yeah. No wrong, you're saying W R O N G. Yeah, wrong thing. Right, right. <laughs> Um, well, there's a lot we could unpack in, in what you just said. There are a lot of implications to that whole thing. I mean, it, it goes to a very deep point, doesn't it, where um, there's this, and on the one hand, we, we kind of perceive ourselves as being an individual, and, we, and we, to a certain extent, we need to perceive ourselves as being an individual in order to function in the world, uh, but then that gets sort of magnified out of proportion, yes. you know, to the point where we... Um, we're kind of like trying, I'm sure there's all sorts of um, myths and stories in, in antiquity about this to the point where we're kind of, you know, going it alone, like Moby Dick comes to mind, you know, just fighting against the <laughs> the powers of nature. And, uh, you know, and the, the more we do that, as you just said, the more difficult life becomes. And at a certain point, we kind of, you know, yes. nature beats us down and we think, okay, I've got to, got to find a deeper, yeah, you know. This is very interesting because it, uh, it reminds me about the point I was thinking a couple of days ago. I was reading a poem, and uh, this point that you just mentioned is almost like, uh, imagine the human body. It's, I don't know, 100 trillion cells or less. Or something. But <clears throat> each of the cells 
individually, they function perfectly by themselves as an individual cell. But at the same time, they have this uh, life connection to all the rest and is very crucial to be first functional perfectly as an individual, but not totally centered on the individual. But once that purpose is fulfilled, then to be one with everything else. And in a, in a medical term, if something like that happened and then the cell become too individualistic, that's when the cancer happens. Exactly, yeah. Somebody, when a being completely f start functioning based on a different order, purpose, <laughs> way of being and so on, in a society it can happen like that also. This is very much similar. Yeah, and, and the cancer is not only killing the host organism, but it's killing itself ultimately. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> due to its you know narrow mindedness and selfishness if we can anthropomorphize it <laughs> it's funny too <laughs> yeah so how do we achieve the, the balance you know i mean there's a natural tendency for us to kind of, for the wave to be to be isolated as a wave you know and and yet there's this kind of deeper um motivation to realize our status as the ocean uh, how do we uh, how do we kind of achieve the balance between those two and integrate them and perhaps you know be, get to the point where we can comfortably live the paradox mm -hmm. that's an excellent point <laughs> uh, my thought about that is that uh, how to first become an individual fulfilled individual being in order to be able to become uh, productive and with the consciousness of the whole. Mm -hmm. uh, if the consciousness develops only centered on me, of course that's not that is cancerous being, but the consciousness of the whole is a crucial thing. Uh, one of the conclusions I came across based on my um, childhood was basically <coughs> uh, when we grow up, it's not only our physical body that grows, which actually grows automatically. Just we eat and drink and breathe and we need warmth and light and so on. But there's something else inside of us needs to grow. That is uh, our very essence, the very life that we are. And that's what I call heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons that actually I came across that uh, to find out that essentially we are heart is in these uh, few sentences that I became interested in. One was that uh, uh, the expression, I love you, is a, such a emotionally expressive and a wonderful thing to, see, to say and hear. And then I realized that when you add the word heart to it, it suddenly takes it to a completely different dimension. So when you say, for example, I love you with all my heart, mm -hmm. then I became a little bit curious what is this that when you say with all my heart, what do we really mean? And finally I realized that if, if I tell someone I love you with all my heart, it means that I love you with all that I am. I mean, nothing is held back, no reservation, everything. So that simply means that all that I am is basically expressed through this word heart. That's why I came to call our very essential being heart and then more and more it became more clear that why uh, the things that develops in the heart are so crucial in our relationships with each other <coughs> excuse me uh, and this was the heart that uh, finally uh, I realized is a point that is need need to grow more than anything else and the development of the heart of course is is uh, depending on a loving energy or kind energy that we receive since we were born uh, initially from our parents which plays a very important role and then uh, as we grow up as siblings it helps us to uh, relate to and be a more confident and a stronger being and uh, when we enter into marriage with our spouse, 
that experience again. It, nourish, it nourishes us. And then also when we become parents, that the, that the, the essence that grows inside of us, that it, when we look at the nature of it, we can see we come from a point of being absolutely self-centered as far as wanting and receiving love, so to speak, to the point that ultimately the goal is that we become unconditional in giving that love, uh, which is somehow known as parental love. Mm -hmm. So to come in from a completely self-centered child level to the level of uh, parent, which is unconditional love, this, this experiences that we go through matters a lot. So uh, to answer your question, this is a long answer, <laughs> was that basically when we go through this uh, situation, it, it helps us a lot to become that very individual that we're supposed to be. Uh, I remember when I was studying uh, philosophies and religious books and so on, one of the things that uh, uh, kind of very eye-catching was uh, I was reading the Old Testament and in it there was a, a saying from God to human beings. The first thing was be fruitful. And I thought about the be fruitful a lot for a long time. That what does be fruitful means? And that helped so much to find out actually why are we here? Because when I looked at the rest of the creation, everything around, I found that the, everything exists as a seed level and perfectly contains all its nature and everything that needs. But then when it grows in a right condition, it comes to the point that it becomes fruitful, like apple seed, which is very insignificant looking things when you compare it to the tree. So human being is so much like that. There is seed inside of us that I call heart that needs to grow to come to the point of becoming fruitful. Okay. So I have a few thoughts on that. Um, First of all, I, you, you use the word essence in relation to heart, and that's, you know, we, we speak of artichoke hearts and celery hearts and things like that. And so, you know, that, that is the essence of that, you know, vegetable. And so that's a common usage of the term. But, of course, people also think of the heart or either physical or emotional when they, when they hear the word heart. Um, so are you somehow mixing that connotation in, or are you going more to an even deeper level of, uh, you know, pure consciousness or pure being or something as being the ultimate essence of, of what we are. Yes. yes. And the reason I'm saying that is because when we uh, look at all the different aspects of our relationships as human being, we finally come to conclusion that emotional aspects play the most important role. In other words, emotional aspects are the most important aspects of the relationships. If we have uh, intellectual relationship, uh, conversations, or political, or social, or financial, whatever, and the emotional aspects is missing, then something terribly is missing. The very uh, bonding element is missing. That's why a lot of separations happen, because that emotional thing is not there. That's why I call us our very best sense, our very being, the heart, which is a source of all these emotions that are playing the most important role. So if you could boil it down as fundamentally as possible, are you saying that um, some sort of emotional field is our ultimate essence, or does it go deeper than that? When you are, are there levels to heart, you know, and at the very, very, very deepest level, what is heart? Um, <clears throat> the reason that is a little bit unclear is because the heart or life or, or essence, actually deep life, that's what I'm referring to as the heart. But in order to discover that and allow that to manifest or to develop, uh, we have to become clear on thoughts and perspectives that have been made in our minds through the course of our life. So yes, I do mean actually the deepest, of course not the physical pump, which is also called heart, but the very sense of our being. Like the example I said, I love you with all my heart, or you broke my heart. You know, broke my heart is such a deep level com uh, compared to I'm disappointed. Right. You know, it's a different thing. So that's, yeah, for me when I say heart, I really mean who I am, the very, the I being. Or, okay. 
Well, like, for instance, a few minutes ago, we were talking about um, how a person, they start seeking, and then all these things begin to support them and come their way, and, you know, which implies uh, a much more um, cosmic kind of intelligence that, you know, is governing them. And uh, as a matter of fact, as I'm looking at you here on the on my monitor, I'm seeing I see a picture of many galaxies that I downloaded from NASA, and you know you see this vast, vast, vast you know scope of of the universe. All of it is just you know swimming in an ocean of that life that we referred to earlier, that sort of pure essence of life. So when I think of the essence, that's kind of what I think of is that the the sort of like universal consciousness, universal intelligence that. Uh, in which the whole universe is sustained and contained, um, but and when you speak of emotions and so on, it seems very individuated, and so I have a hard time understanding that as the ultimate essence. So how about let's just imagine that even the essence of all that magnificence that you just expressed, including the consciousness, mm -hmm. is also heart. Yeah, yeah, it w maybe with a big capital H. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then we're in, you know, we're individual expressions of that, which actually in, contains the wholeness. I mean, like a like a hologram, you know, every little bit of it contains the whole image. Um, so that that intelligence, which is so vast and contains the universe, is as much in every of our cells as it is out in every galaxy. Yeah. Um, I don't mean don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I'm just kind of playing with these ideas with you. I, I just heard your dog in the back. Oh, yeah, that's going to happen. It's, it's, in fact, a guy sent in a donation the other day, and he said, you can use this to buy a dog door if you want to. <laughs> I agree with what you're saying. <laughs> you know, the, say, for example, if we, one thing that came to my mind as you were making that comment was this uh, uh, religious expression of referring to God as love mm -hmm. because love really is the most by far powerful of all things and it's true I believe in that 100% of course there is consciousness of course there is intelligence there is will purpose, order, principles, reasons connections, they all exist but I believe that those are all expression of this fundamental energy field that is essentially emotional. Mm -hmm. And the easiest thing to refer to by name is heart. That's interesting. So so you would say that the what you know you just rattled off a bunch of qualities intelligence consciousness and so on. Uh you're saying that that intelligence or consciousness which is universal which contains and gives rise to and dissolves all the, the, the whole universes is essentially emotional in, in that it has the quality of love. Yeah. Say for example if you take ourselves human being mm -hmm. as a image or expression manifestation of that very life then we look at ourselves then we can see that we have those attributes and qualities as well. Mm. But then the deepest of all these back comes back again with with all my heart thing. Yeah. <laughs> so you just said, you know, man is made in the image of God. That's essentially what you just said. In a religious form. In a religious expression. Yeah. In religious expression. Now in a scientific expression, we are manifestation of the very life that bubbles inside of us, not only you and I and everybody around, but the entire universe mm -hmm. is sustained even scientifically by the same energy and same principles, same physics, the way that the cells are made and functions of different things, the atoms and molecules. It's all, you know, one thing, whether we bring the stone from moon to here and analyze it, it's the same structure as a stone that we have here by the ocean hmm. or in your backyard. So there's this oneness in everything. Yeah. Um. <laughs> There's this kind of a subtle train of thought that I'm leading along here, which is, I think is going okay. Uh, we're, and, and we've talked about heart, we've talked about essence, and you've, you mentioned earlier um, the need to really fully become an individual in order to, I think that's the phrase you use, to 
you know, or fully develop as an individual in order to kind of really appreciate this, I guess. Um, and so one thing I would ask is, you know, can one fully become an in, fully develop as an individual without recourse to this deeper dimension? You know, it's it's not like okay, first I'm going to fully develop as an individual, then I'll be qualified to get into this deeper dimension. Don't the two really have to kind of go hand in hand? Uh, the development of both, or rather, the appreciation of the deeper dimension, kind of provides a foundation for the full blossoming of the individual. You know, the 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 reason that we talk about these things now, you and I, and also conversations exist thousands of times maybe right now all around the world between people and it happened millions of times or more throughout the history is because we are in search of actually going back or becoming the very being that we're supposed to be when we look around in the nature and so on we see everything functioning so harmoniously mm -hmm. and uh, in connection with each other there is something different in human being that uh, maybe is called choice or free will mm. that when it's being misused <laughs> which apparently is and has been uh, by studying the human history we can see we have we have derailed so to speak we have come a wrong way for a long time and so the reason I'm saying is that we are now trying to find the way back that's why we're having a conversation and analyzing things and trying to find deeper things to but in reality uh, a human being is designed so that if everything functions correctly uh, we actually become those individuals who are actually in harmony and oneness with everyone else and with the nature around us <coughs> Well, that's a big if, though. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I wrote down the word choice about 10 minutes ago, and now you just said it, because you were talking about how a little baby is born, and according to how much love he receives from his parents and how supportive the environment is, so, you know, he, so he develops accordingly. Uh, but, uh, and so, but, you know, everybody has shortcomings in that department, um, and if we wanted to, we could just always blame our parents or whatever for for our faults or our limitations but then you know who then our, the, by that token our kids can blame us <laughs> so it seems that at a certain point choice needs to grow and one can begin to steer the course of one's life regardless of what the upbringing was exactly exactly because uh, i came to the conclusion that nobody's at fault whether our parents or grandparents and so on. it's just like everybody did the best they could yeah as much as they could mm -hmm. that is true but uh, <clears throat> so you're right I mean there's no need to blame but at one point hopefully we come to the point of choosing not to blame and then looking inward to find out what it is that needs to become clear and what answers it is that we can find mm -hmm. because if we are not, and this is not actually if this is a reality that we are the expression and manifestation of the life the life does uh, function inside of us so there is a way to connect to that there is a way to connect to that if we get the obstacles out of the way okay let's talk about that uh, what, what is that way and how do we get the obstacles out of the way obstacles first are the this uh, mind constructed uh, perspectives of who I am, who you are, who are we, how we should connect to each other, how should we should treat each other. And uh, so if you look, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at the way we treat each other, for example, whether now or all throughout human history, we can see that uh, we see two different ways that people treated each other. One was based on self-centeredness, and the result of it was a lot of times, or if not all, destructive. One was with trying to control, which was no good. Another one was uh, to be in a selfless way and giving, even though maybe it hasn't been received rightly by the people on the other side, but it always works better. And this is one of the lessons we can learn from the life and the nature around us, that everything that exists, exists for the sake of a higher purpose. So, 
by that maybe we can come to a conclusion that maybe the best way of living and being is an unselfish way of life living for the sake of others and this we can find in all the teachings and light teachings of everyone but the reason for that is that it actually unites us with everything and everyone if we take our mind off of ourselves to a certain degree of course you and I are responsible for ourselves I mean I cannot expect you to take care of me or pay for me and so on when I'm grown up and adult and so on. as a baby yes but later on no so we are we have certain responsibility as an individual towards ourselves to maintain ourselves and all that but that is enough but after that to be one and harmonious for the sake of others that's why I'd like service to others becomes important uh, uh, way of life yeah you know I was thinking as you're saying that of again the example of the baby I mean the baby has to be completely in a position of taking he's not in a position to give at that stage you know um, and later on he uh, you know grows to a mature human being and and potentially potentially at least is in a position to serve and help and so on but you know many people don't shift into that mode they're they're still very much in a in a taking mentality <laughs> and, and you know the whole world situation is is evidence of that the environmental disasters and, and everything else um, so I guess that I'm always kind of looking for the practical you know like yeah. how do we actually I mean is it just by talking about it and people listen and hopefully they kind of change their attitudes or is, the, is there you know how are we going to get the world to kind of turn itself around or, or at least how would you the world may be too big how would you get an individual to, to yeah. sh shift around and, and sh from more of a, t a to, to more of a giving mentality <coughs> wow a lot of points <laughs> <laughs> you know that you started from a baby mm -hmm. uh, this was a very good point because uh, one of my observations was that uh, you said that baby grows and uh, comes to the point of maturity and start giving and all that potentially yes but then that is the point because there, there this actually indicates that there are two kinds of maturity mm. internal and external externally we grow we become mature as well but the point is that whether are we are mature internally right that's why then you can see uh, people uh, at the higher age of, I don't know, 20, 30, 50, 60, whatever, in some aspect, they behave in a way that you see in a six-month-old or a two-year-old, and that aspect of uh, being self-centered and wanting everything, me, 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 me thing kind mm -hmm. of thing. So that was the point I was trying to bring before, that it's this emotional development inside that I came to the conclusion that is the standard of maturity. Yeah. So the maturity is a more emotional maturity than a physical maturity. Sure. I mean, look at you know that something that's very much in the news right now. That girl from Pakistan, Malala, who is 14 years old, and she's more mature than the vast majority of adults. You know, trying to promote education for for women and everything. And then look at the guy who shot her. You know, think of his level of emotional maturity. Yet he's probably three times her age. Um, so, but again, it comes down to well, how do we develop malalas? You know, how do we, what, what kind of, what's the, f the, the lever or the, the, the mechanism through which uh, this can be developed? I mean, I'm sure a lot of educators ask the same questions when they have a classroom full of, you know, kids who've had miserable upbringings and they're all misbehaving and going on to commit crime and go to jail. Now, this is a good point because uh, I, I did teach for several years mm -hmm. uh, so I was in touch with people uh, children maybe at a young age from first to sixth grade and this point came out and then I could reflect back on my own life my suggestion to this since I'm very much uh, evidently up to this point centered on the heart and the development of the heart and emotional development and maturity <coughs> is that even if I didn't go through the like a correct ideal course of emotional nourishment through my life uh, the, the, the important point here is to realize that even if I would have gone 
through that, the person that I would become would be a manifestation of the person who is able to be with people and treat people, relate to people in different positions that we go emotionally through. In other words, <clears throat> if there's a requirement at the time for me to be in a position of a child emotionally, I should be able to do that. If there are times that it's required for me to be a brother or in a parent, like a father position, in, our, in a relationship with people, because these things happen all the time. When we look emotionally into the, into the nature of our relationships with each other, <clears throat> we can see that we go through these emotions. Our relationships with humanity is basically that of siblings and parent and child. This goes all the time. And so uh, if I would have gone through the correct path, I would be able to manifest that ideally with everyone around and that would be called mature mm -hmm. now I didn't <clears throat> so how do I fix that now my conclusion was that to uh, to actually practice that even though if I didn't have the foundation enough for me to realize they say for example if I'm if I meet you for a first time in a gas station somewhere and then we have a conversation or in the store or in a party somewhere and <clears throat> when we're having a conversation if we have uh, a full attention with both ears and both eyes to listen and to observe people we begin to actually feel and hear the emotions that coming from the person through that emotions the, the more we become humble and then observe that, it puts us in a position to realize who am I with this person at this moment. Say, for example, if there's a need for me to be parental, a need to be, to be a sibling or to be a child, this will establish an emotional relationship far deeper and more important than a intellectual conversations or social conversation or political or financial. Any At the, <clears throat> at the depth of our conversation, there should always be this emotional connection. And those emotional connections, whether it's friendly or in a deeper level as sibling, child, parent, this will help actually to nourish what hasn't been nourished inside of us. That's actually how I worked on myself and it worked. And I suggested to many people and it worked for them too. And it's constantly, I'm hearing, te hearing testimonies from my friends that it actually it does work. It makes life more peaceful, and growing happens, maturity happens, connections happens, forgiveness happens. Okay, so what you're saying, uh, let me just repeat it to you so that I can make sure that I've understood it correctly. Uh, you're saying that you worked on yourself and you have advised others successfully to work on themselves by learning to be, uh, culturing the ability to be adaptable to whomever you were dealing with to, you know, whether it's a child or a peer or a, a someone, you know, uh, that you might approach with respect or whatever, but you, you're not locked into one uh, strata. You're able to flow uh, and adapt yourself to the, the needs of the, circ of the situation at hand and that, you know, that has been a conscious choice and by practicing that you have cultured and developed that uh, that ability and that has been that has enabled you to kind of grow into a more kind of complete multi-dimensional human being is that correct assessment of what you said it's perfect you very <laughs> <laughs> that you said is basically are the emotional thing mm -hmm. because we can be very highly intellectual very bright very you know intelligent person in our conversation and all that but then that is not necessarily a foundation by itself as a one bonding good relationship if the emotions that are required are not there. Uh, a simple example that comes to my mind, for example, in a, this is a little bit sensitive issue, but like in a marital relationship, you know, people get married and so on. Now, during the marriage life, 
we can all experience and see that we are not always in a position, so to speak, of husband and wife. There are times happens in life because, because our very essence and heart is constantly growing, is ever growing element. Uh, therefore, therefore, life brings all these constant uh, circumstances for us to develop this heart. That's why that when uh, we are relating to people, we come to these positions all the time. We come to these realms, these positions of the emotions and heart. So, my experience was that uh, with my wife that we are not always just a husband and wife. There are times that we are actually like a mother son. There are situations in life happens that is a mother son relationship, or father daughter relationship, or brother and sister relationship. And these are important because this is a constant nourishment and constant development of our very being, which is an ever-growing, ever-expanding thing. Now, how would that happen depends on our ability of being able to be a child, being able to be a brother or sister, husband, wife, or father and mother when life requires, when that situation or scenario, so to speak, happens, and then is it time to function? When is it time to function as a mother and son? Are we able to be a child or not? My realization was that I wasn't able. Why? Because when I went through the school of life in first grade, which was a childhood, or elementary school, which was a childhood, if I didn't have the experience enough to, to know how to be a child, to, to like I did not graduate from childhood I did not graduate from a level of sibling so those experience in a school of life prepares us how to relate to others and I, I believe that the most important aspect of our relationships with each other is that how we treat each other emotionally hmm. if, if that is correct then everything works out well this example that you said about this girl this 14 year old girl and the man who shot him so something terribly was missing in their heart level. At least, this, in, at least in his heart level, <laughs> the guy who shot her. Her heart, it was perfect. Yeah. It, it was a heart of embracing mm -hmm. everyone, oneness with everyone. And the other heart, even though there was a lot of logical reasons that he might have in his own mind you know, why he, he does, does a crime and like all the other criminals, but the heart is in the wrong place. So it's not so much the intellect and reason and the politics and finance and all that is where the how, how mature the heart is because then we be able to actually see, hear, feel from the heart. And if you don't see from the heart, if you don't hear from the heart, we are actually blind and deaf. If you only see through the intellect or power or money or whatever, we are blind and deaf. Yeah. So it all comes back to, again, you know, how do we evolve as a species so that, uh, you know, the majority of us function through the heart, which I think you would agree would solve uh, a lot of the environmental and economic and political problems that, you know, dominate the news headlines. Uh, you know, how does it become more of a mainstream thing? Uh, and maybe it's happening automatically. I mean, maybe that that divine intelligence or whatever that we spoke about in the beginning is just orchestrating a big change in the world and we're just along for the ride. But, um, you know, we'd what? like to, we'd like to think that maybe we can do our best to cooperate and facilitate, uh, and, and not just sort of be carried along passively in the stream, but, you know, really kind of move it on, you know, get it. Yes. It, uh, that, that design exists as you can see it functions all around us the only place it doesn't function is in us now why well, it does but there's a blockage you know that yeah basically it does but then because of our choice or mm. because of the way we think our perspectives and all that uh, we have come to the point of making such a mess look at the look at the history of the humanity and look at today's world right but 
this is a situation now which is to me is almost like the end of a sickness you know a sickness starts with a small cough and then it develops to more and more and more you get fever and you I'm sorry you throw up and all kind but <laughs> the worse it becomes it actually gets close to its end as well mm. so we all have experience when we were sick so as a body of humanity it seems like we're going towards that as well and especially with the advance of the communications the internet that the oneness that is happening externally in the world is an indication of that we are also internally getting close to the point of realizing that some of the standards of reference that we've been keeping up whether it's a racial or religious or philosophical or whatever that divides us are basically not right. Anything that divides us in nature is not right because we, are, we have so much in common. Our interests are common. We depend on each other. Our very happiness depends on each other, which is the deepest desire in all of us. You know, we 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 destroy the very source of our own happiness by mistreating each other. <laughs> so yeah. we're coming to that point. We're coming to that point, but we have to wake up to something. It, this free choice that we have, this free will that we have, we can exercise it now mm. towards the whole rather than self, individual, and this will assist this original design of oneness that is actually, as you said, is taking place now. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the, the technological oneness is a, uh, a symptom of a, a deeper oneness that's dawning. And it also feeds back and helps to um, f accelerate the, the, the rise of that deeper oneness. You know, I mean, like the conversation we're having, we couldn't have this without this technology. <laughs> and then thousands of people all over the world will watch this, you know. And, and so it's, it's a kind of a self, what they call self-reinforcing uh, feedback loop that's going on. Yeah, and it's very helpful. Yeah. It's helpful. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we just hope that, I mean, the, the metaphor you used of the disease, you know, sometimes you don't get over the disease. It gets worse and worse, and then you die. So let's just hope that <laughs> in this case, the, the disease that we see in the world is not our, going to be the death of us, but we'll be, you know, we'll get over it. And, you know, as the people like to predict with 2012 and all, we'll, we'll move into a much brighter age. <laughs> you know, it, it, this uh, brought me to a thought of uh, energy. Mm -hmm. uh, some time ago, I came to realize that how fundamental energy is and how real energy is, even though it's an invisible thing, so it's not in our consciousness every day and so on. But energy is, say, for example, everything that we think is an energy form and it creates energy. Everything we say creates an energy, even though we don't see it, but it does. And it's timeless. Energy, uh, also the things we do. So <clears throat> here comes the very important point. We can see now, despite all the wrong things, such a destructive thing that is going on in the world, but also this great move of uh, right, enlightenment, oneness, so to speak, is also happening in the world. It's amazing, you know, sometimes in my email I receive things from people and it's circulating all around the world with a really deep, wise words, and the people become very moved by it. The reason they become moved by it, it, made, it makes because it makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. And it's all actually, at the core, it brings us towards unity, towards oneness. This is also happening. So we are producing a lot of energy also in a constructive way. And I think this balance of energy that we are producing is the one that will cause the change. So I can see far more now, even despite of all the visible destructive wrong things, at the essence and fundamentally far more powerful energy of good is rising. It's not yet visible until it suddenly shows. <laughs> mm. Yeah, there's some interesting uh, thoughts on that. I mean, one thing is that if, if you heat up a pan of water, 
nothing much seems to be happening until it gets to actually 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and then all of a sudden there's a phase transition and it boils, you know, and turn, turns to steam. But in, you know, it could be at 210 or 211, and it looks pretty much like a, a same as 150. But when it gets to that phase transition point, poof! Absolutely, there's a big change. This is perfect example. Yeah, and there's a, there's another thought, which is that um, you know, based on what you said, is that you know, which which is cause for optimism for me anyway, which is that subtler is more powerful. You know, I, I mean, the, in this pen, the, on this level, is a certain amount of energy. I could drop it, and it would have an effect. But uh, on the molecular level, if I burned it, there would be more energy released. On the atomic level, more energy released. And they say that you know, in just the uh, thing the size of the tip of your pinky, on, on the level of the vacuum state, there's more energy. En energy than in the entire manifest universe. And so the kind of energy you and I are talking about here is more subtle and therefore hopefully much more influential than the more gross, obvious forms of energy and influence that we see around us. Yes, and is actually as powerful, if not more. Say, for example, if you look at the power of words, mm -hmm. the words have been spoken hundreds or thousands of years ago. If they were true, time could not dissolve them and they are powerful today and life-changing is that amazing I mean somebody said yeah. thousands of years ago simple sentences and now people who are hearing it now suddenly it makes sense and it changes them of course it happens through the intellectual understanding and sometimes but the energy of the truth that exists in them is timeless Millions of other sentences and words and conversations have happened throughout history that no one remembers. Not that they were wrong, but uh, some wrong ones definitely don't stand the test of time, so to speak. But, uh, but that energy is very powerful. I believe actually in that energy. And as the first point that you were mentioning about the optimism is a very important thing because it creates this attitude of never giving up. Because what is a giving up? End <laughs> of anything. Whatever it is you do, if you give up, that's the end of it. Right. But the stories uh, all throughout human history tells us over and over and over again that if you don't give up, almost the 11th hour, something magically happens that changes the whole thing around, whether the true stories or even the fictional stories. It all trying to develop this attitude of not giving up. And it works. Yeah. Works. There's there's so many children's stories in that vein, like the little engine that could, or Horton and the Who, you know, Dr. Seuss story that you just, uh, you know, the elephant says, I, I said what I said and I meant what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. And he sits on the egg <laughs> until eventually it hatches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and all the great people who actually came to the same conclusion to realize that, it, it, the attitude of can or cannot impacts us to the great degree that there are sayings like I don't know if it was Henry Ford or someone a lot of people say the same thing that whether you think you can or can't you're right Yeah, and it's true because it develops a different attitude and energy in us that makes the things more work or fail that's a good point and you know with regard to spirituality I mean sometimes these principles are popularized with regard to material accomplishments you know I, I believe I can get this shiny new car but um, you know with regard to spirituality which many of the people most of the people listening to this show are interested in uh, I think it's a good thing to have in mind which is that you you know if you uh, persist if you're persistent and and uh, continue on it'll bear fruit you know you, you needn't get discouraged absolutely yeah. And it has been even both philosophically and religiously and through the experience have been uh, emphasized all the time. When you were saying that, uh, it reminded me of the story that, uh, or a sentence that Jesus was talking about that is that if you set your priorities right, it's, it's all a matter of priority. You know, if, if you focus too much on getting and having and material and all that, then that becomes the focus of life. But then if we focus on becoming who we are, which is actually more magnificent than everything we can ever accumulate, then for some reason said all those things shall be added unto you. Exactly. 
look at the lilies, look at the bird, and so on, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's just like everything is provided, but it's just a matter of which path we walk, mm -hmm. what the focus, the priority. As, as far as the material and so on, is a matter of ownership. Is there's no problem to having a material. All this wonderful material exists all around us for all humanity. The only thing it becomes wrong when the ownership changes. The, the, whether we, are, we own the material or material owns us. Mm. See, somebody owns the car or somebody is owned by the car. In other words, when we define ourselves through what we have and who we are, how we look and so on, that's when the path goes wrong. Yeah, there's an even deeper implication. There's there's something in the Bhagavad Gita about the, the talking about the authorship of action, and and it's said that those who uh, assume that the, the who take themselves to be the actor are like a thief because they're 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 taking possession of something which doesn't actually belong to them. That in fact there's a deeper principle which we've been referring to throughout this interview which is the real um, engine behind our activity and you know it's, it's come up again and again as we've spoken that if we, if we you know have this sort of rigid calcified uh, grip on my way or the highway <laughs> then it causes all kinds of friction and problems but if we can kind of relax and, and recognize that there's a deeper uh, something or other that's that's conducting affairs, then we can just, life becomes much more smooth and, and harmonious. Yes. You know, this, uh, the, the, the old saying of all the people who reached any level of enlightenment has always been this, know thyself. Mm -hmm. Because there's a secret in there, there's the key to everything is in there. Because if I am the manifestation of life like I can say I'm essentially life as I, I, when I was born and all the potentials and everything physically in externally and internally that functions in me that is the most crucial thing to discover once I discover that then I discover everything in other words if I know who I am I know who you are yeah because you and I are the same life. Even though we, we, we manifest in a different way, like a two different flowers or trees or whatever. But essential life that is inside of us, the fundamental principles of existence is the same. So to know who I am, this sense of know who you are, know yourself, is actually very important. And as we were talking at the beginning, the biggest obstacles to know who I am, which is the life, is my own thoughts and habits that have been generated because of the events and experiences that I've been through. So to, to be able to focus in, on them and observe them, to clarify, to get rid of some of them, becomes a way to actually become the life, to know who I am. And I believe everything will change from then on. And if you don't know who you are, how can you know anything? <laughs> I mean, you, you say, I know the pen. <laughs> but I don't know who I am, so therefore, you know, who knows the pen? What is the pen? You know, it can't really be appreciated if, if, <laughs> if the knower isn't known. If I know myself, I know you. If I don't know myself, what do I really know? Right. A lot of maybe intellectual information. But uh, time proved over and over again that that's not enough. Now, but, if, we, if we say that, you know, false <laughs> ideas and false notions and and so on are the impediment to knowing who we are or are, are obscuring the knowledge of who we are uh, then again the question comes well how do you get rid of all that stuff and how many layers of it are there you know you might get rid of a few layers and think well I'm done but then you know, how many more layers are there beneath that which have yet to be cleared away <laughs> you're right there are definitely many layers because uh, for some of us it started from a very childhood or previous lives, even if we believe in that, you know. go that far. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even uh, there are layers that is true, but the most important thing is actually to start. Yes, yes. Because the moment we start and we start uh, f becoming free from even layer number one, or a second, or third, or fourth layer, and so on, that in itself gives us such a encouragement 
and more importantly, a different perspective of seeing. I, I, I'm completely amazed at how, how much we can see and hear differently uh, from, a, from a perspective of, as I call, heart or original being. Because <clears throat> it is possible to actually look and not see all there is to be seen. It's possible to listen and not hear all there is to be heard. Not only possible, it's inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but say for example, a lot of time in a conversation or being in, a, in events with people and so on, <clears throat> because one of the uh, important elements for us to be able to become united and one with everything around us is for us to be present and the importance of being present is simply in the fact that the life the life that I'm expression of happens only in this world, it happens what happened <clears throat> and what is going to happen is not what is happening so a uh, few minutes ago or 10, 15, 20 minutes ago we started a conversation and it was just as real as now maybe another 5, 10, 20 minutes or whatever we talk and that would be also as real as now but this is the life because life is not what happened what is going to happen life is what's happening what is that's why it's so important for me also to be present when life is happening when life is happening if my mind takes me to the back and the future then I'm not here yeah. <laughs> therefore I really can't see my senses will not even function 100% I, I, I kind of see kind of hear but I cannot describe something I have to say excuse me what did you say <laughs> could you repeat again <laughs> I mean, sometimes it also happens even if I'm present. <laughs> uh, John, John Lennon said, life is what happens when we're making other plans, while we're busy making other plans. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I mean, of course, on this theme of, uh, you know, not fully perceiving everything that's here, there's a certain practical limitation to that. We wouldn't want to perceive every aspect of the electromagnetic spectrum or something we'd be overwhelmed or, or hear every frequency that exists we'd be overwhelmed so there, there's a certain limitation that is natural to being a human being but th that in, a, in another sense and perhaps you can expound on this uh, there are unnecessary and artificial limitations you know th those are desirable limitations that I just referred to but there's a kind of an undesirable limitation that we want to get cleared away exactly exactly that's why that sometimes uh, I've been in a, in a situations in a groups that uh, someone said something and uh, people made a comment about it and then somebody made a comment about it that almost like everybody was amazed because it showed the level of the depth of seeing and hearing what that person expressed and uh, so that that's maybe something to do with the uh, maturity, with a presence, with being 100% attentive, being free from the self, mm. and completely in serving or being involved with what is happening. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Is uh, we, can, we can deepen that level constantly, and that would impact our relationships over and over again. In fact, that is what causes our relationship to grow closer to each other. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's worth bringing in the word appreciation here. Um, you know, it's one can be very attentive to the details of a situation on a physical level, but there's the, the dimension for growth is in terms of deeper and deeper and deeper appreciation, and that can be that can reach really sublime levels. That's right. This is this is yeah. so glad you brought this up. Appreciation, the gratitude. Mm -hmm. That, that is very true. I, I recently came to realize that actually gratitude is a source of happiness. Mm. <laughs> you know, simply, you know, the more the, the way we look at things and the more we, we are grateful and there are so much to be grateful about. It's just like countless. And the, if the less grateful we are, the more unhappy we are. <laughs> So appreciation is very important, you know. Yeah, I, yeah, of course, you know. That, but yeah. I'm 
you brought it up. It's very important. And I would say not just gratitude, like we're going to have a Thanksgiving in a few days, and people will be, oh, thank you for the food, and you know, thank you for our our nice house and our 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 nice family and all that stuff. But even you know, walking down the street, look look at a bug on the sidewalk or something. There can be a level of appreciation of that yes. percep perception that can that can go very deep. Yes, and even the fact that I can actually walk down the street, the mm. fact that I can look and see. Because uh, uh, I came across people who actually, uh, for some accident, lost their sight. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the priorities were set straight, and then they were expressing the fact that I, I'm willing to give anything, everything, to be able to see again. Yeah. So just this, just to be in an appreciative mood that actually I can see. You know, I can see you, and I still can see you. You know, I can hear these things function. You're right, and this is like a the fundamental joy there is a word for it bliss mm -hmm. is being ananda yeah the, this the life that is functioning in itself is such an incredible magic so i can walk i can see i can breathe i can look at the trees i can look at the bug as you said you know recognize it. <laughs> yeah yeah mm. some people say that um you know it's that that kind of the self-realization we've been talking about becomes a foundation for the the, uh, the growth of appreciation that we're, we're now discussing that you know once you know who you are then you can really begin to get a deeper sense of yeah. what all this is and then naturally you begin to wonder well who or what is responsible for all this you know I, I love the art I'd like to meet the artist artist <laughs> that is true yeah that's absolutely true that that is very important. You're right. The, the more we we be, get to know ourselves, the who we really are. And the word you said was we begin to wonder, and that wonderment would be the state of being because the word wonderful simply means full of wonder. Mm. You know. So when we look at around and say this is wonderful. There is, we can say it with a deeper and deeper and deeper level, the more we actually see the wonder in everything. And that's what really life is. And the artist <laughs> is that life. I mean, uh, for example, I talked throughout the years in a conversation, sometimes very heated conversation and so on, about the subject, the hot subject of Hard subject of what did you say? Hot. Very Hard. Hot. H hot. Oh, H O T. Hot subject of God. Ah, uh -huh. okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there, people say, "I believe, I don't believe. I believe, I don't believe." This has been going on for thousands of years. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's far more important to find out, it, beside the beliefs and images that we have about God, to find out what is it that we're referring to as God. Uh, God in English language three letter word G-O-D is referring to it's just a name but it's amazing the images that it has created because of whatever reasons there are millions of reasons in the minds of billions and billions of people in a way of belief and disbelief love or even hate but if you look at what it is we're referring to my conclusion was that actually it's the life itself and not yours and mine's and the life that we see around us, but that that invisible energy and source that sustains everything, that has all the characteristics in it. This artist word that you said was very interesting. <laughs> say, uh, I'm a musician, say, I, I listen to Beethoven. Of course, I don't know Beethoven. I heard of Beethoven and so on, but there is no way for me to personally meet Beethoven, but when I study his work, then I begin to actually see the invisible being of Beethoven in his work. That's why works of Beethoven and Mozart or Haydn or Chopin, they're so different from each other, or any artist. You, know, you look at Van Gogh or Monet or someone, they are different because they are the expression of their invisible nature. And 
when you study, there are people who actually listen to the music and exactly say, who is written by? <laughs> you know, to that degree, because they got to know the being inside. So for the artist of life, we have ourselves and everything around us to study and find out the fundamental principles and reasons and the laws that exist and functions in us is basically the expression of that. In a religious way, is expressed through being made in the image of. It's like the work of Beethoven is made in the image of Beethoven, <laughs> or the paintings of Van Gogh is an image of Van Gogh, even though he's long gone. So we can find the artist, but again, the path of this goes back to the knowing the self. This self is the key. <laughs> that being inside is the key to to knowing of everything. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, I'm tempted to end it here because I don't know if we can do better than what you just said. It was so 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 sublime. <laughs> Although it's a joy to always continue. Um, it's so beautiful because we actually bounce off each other and we talk and this is the best way of conversation we, we talk, we learn from each other we stimulate each other's uh, life inside and it just, things comes out in an incredible way, we can sit down and talk for hours, endlessly because there's really no end the, when we enter into the path of life, who we are in that oneness there's endlessness of yeah. It's so beautiful. I'm I'm very grateful, you know, to this conversation we had. Well, one other thought I had when you were talking about, you know, the debates you've had with people who either believe or don't believe in God and and stuff like that. It's like, um, you know, it's, it reminds me of two guys. They found a restaurant menu and they start arguing over, you know, what whether this food really exists or not, and so on and so forth. Where you know they could actually walk in the door of the restaurant and see if it's there and then and actually taste it so you know people sometimes ask me well what do you believe and I, I might say well I believe this and that but it's really I you know in the same breath I have to say it's really not that important what I believe what's important is what's experienced you know because uh, beliefs you know, they're, just, they're just kind of on the, the crust on the surface yeah and they can change you know yeah they can sure instantly sometimes mm -hmm. but uh, when when I realized that uh, because I let me back up a little bit I realized later on that I've been searching for something very deep in uh, me my I God and that's why I started studying things reading things religious books philosophical books all kinds of books by all writers and <clears throat> my conclusion finally came to this point that it is important uh, uh, to know God and then in search of God I came to realize yes it's true there is there is a being there is a force there is a power that created everything I didn't create myself and one thing that helped me very much was that in order to find out why I'm here it is very important for me to find out to find the maker because of the simple fact that the purpose of any created being is determined by its creator not by itself mm. even though I was going around and seeing all around me we just go around and make purpose for ourselves no, this is why I'm here, this is why I'm here and so on and so on and so on And then, but the real purpose is determined and made by the maker the creator mm -hmm. uh, so when I say life uh, I mean literally the greatest power, the greatest creative power that is constantly even creative. I mean, everything around us is constantly functioning. The, we still breathe, <laughs> you know, we give up carbon dioxide and the trees pick that up and then give us oxygen and we breathe out. And then this, this is just a drop in the ocean of the magnificence and the magic of life, the functions of our body, our interactions and everything. Else. We eat the food, some energy of it stays in us and sustains us what is in the design of that food fruits and vegetables and so on it is so one with us that is constantly nourished you know what I'm trying to say this, this design, this magnificent thing life 
which is very easy for me to call it God or life without any and it's, a, it's not a belief system anymore it's actually knowing it's seeing experiencing it every moment mm -hmm. of every day in every cell of the body and when you make a point like that it's uh, tempting for me to zoom the lens way out and and have the perspective that you know we are God having this conversation we're you, you and I Mayor Dad and Rick we're like sense organs of the infinite uh, through which that infinite intelligence is enjoying interacting within itself uh, you know there's a there's a there's a verse in somewhere I think it's in the Gita where or maybe somewhere else where L Lord Krishna says um, uh, curving back on myself I create again and again so there's this like self interacting dynamics going on within this intelligence that uh, or God or whatever we want to call it that creates this manifest universe and we're just like little tentacles you know, little little sense organs of that um, thinking ourselves to be individuals and in some sense we are but ultimately you know we are that universal intelligence just entertaining itself within itself yeah I, I often thought about this uh, that um, this comes a little bit to the to the quest for why are we here? Mm -hmm. And in search of that, I came uh, in, a, in a religious uh, studies, I came across this sentence uh, that uh, it says, God said, let's create man in our own image. So I read that for many years and so on. At one point, suddenly it became a mystery because in the other studies that I have, I realized that the God being does not have an image and in fact it's forbidden to make an image <laughs> you know thou shalt not make an image so an imageless being created man in his own image and who knows what the original word in that scripture was that is being translated as image you know I mean there must be some deeper significance to that right so then uh, yeah I don't uh, for, from what I know up to this point is that uh, there is something in our very essence of course it's not physical thing that is an image but is a is a very essence is a very core of our being that reflects something and that is true actually with everything that exists everything that exists is the image of life and you know, was image of God but if stone you know a grain of sand a flower everything that exists uh, up to human being with all these potentials and capabilities uh, is not to, to boast about or to be arrogant about but human being is a very incredible being very incredible piece of creation you know when you objectively look at this being with all these capabilities of thinking and creativity which is a result of having a freedom to choose you know, all, you, you can see that all the other animals they, they live exactly in a way that is already programmed in them they function perfectly and harmoniously but human being can think human being can design houses in a different ways you know otherwise we would all be living like in a ants or in a beehives kind of thing all the same so this potential that exists in human beings it's not only the physical ability, but also the internal abilities of uh, uh, what we are capable of. And it comes back again to the to the heart. Uh, one thing that I wanted to to conclude with the heart that I wanted to say before is that in that point of fruitfulness, uh, the 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 example of an apple seed that contains everything that it needs, everything. All it needs is a right circumstances to be planted in a good soil, to be taken care of, to have water, to have light, to have warmth, and it grows and grows and grows. Finally, it comes to the point of becoming a tree, and then fruits comes out. All that was in that little thing. It was there. It doesn't need any uh, change, any addition. It's all perfectly there. So human being is very much like that. When a human child is born, it's like that apple seed. It just needs that environment, ideal environment, which is, of course, physically is important, but more importantly, emotional. Mm 
if the emotional taking care of the warmth and the light and the energy is installed, something that that seed grows inside, which is like the heart that grows when the heart comes to the point of maturity is a point of being fruitful. And what are the fruits of the heart? The fruits of the heart is all the virtues, the virtues that we know are good, the virtues that we consciously try to act upon, being being kind, being sympathy, uh, having sympathy or empathy or uh, understanding or giving and caring and all the rest of the virtues. Those are actually already embedded in our being, in the seed that is heart. So when the heart does grow, then comes the point of being fruitful and when, the, when it's fruitful, then the virtues comes out automatically. And when we sum up all the virtues together, we come to this thing called love. Because love is literally the expression of all the virtues. <laughs> yeah, no, that's beautiful. Fruitfulness. So that's why it's so imperative, so important for us to actually grow artistically. Mm-hmm. Our emotional body grows. And if someone listening to this thinks, oh dear, you know, I had an alcoholic father or I was abused as a child or, you know, I didn't get the kind of my, my teacher used to beat me or whatever, you know, uh, they shouldn't be disheartened because, as we've been saying, um, all that can be repaired, all that can be um, overcome. Absolutely, because I, I, I can identify with that, not maybe at that extreme uh, scenario, but I, I understand what that is. You know, to go through the situations of having emptiness, vacuums inside of the chambers of our hearts, so to speak, having pain even. But it is possible once we realize, okay, that's the situation, that's the reality, that's what is. Now, the way out is that if I continue on the path of the heart, as if even I was growing up ideally, even if I was growing up ideally, still my relationship with others would be within this realm, emotional realms of siblings and parent and child. So if I didn't, path remains the same. That means that if you and I meet somewhere for a first time and start having a conversation, we can have a conversation on any topic, whether it's a business or politics or finance or whatever. But the most important thing is that are we aware that at that moment, from a life perspective, we need to have this emotional connection with each other. Because it's possible to actually live for hours, days, weeks, months, and years without the emotional connection to people. And being very happy with the external ex- uh, relationships, you know, social relationship, intellectual, but not actually opening the heart and connecting in a heart level. I'm completely convinced that if I'm not in a heart relationship with people, I'm not alive. Of course, I'm physically alive, I'm still able to talk and walk and having a conversation, but the life, which is also has heart as its essence, is not happening in me. So therefore, it's my choice, my decision to actually remain in the chambers or in the realms of an emotional relationship with people all the time. So I can have an interesting thing about it is that it's not even uh, age related because I can I can meet somebody half ages me, you know, how do you say it? Younger than me, much younger. Half your age. Half my age, right. Thank you. And then still in the course of our conversation, those changing of positions still happens. I have experience with that even uh, when my child, for example, was 10 year old or 12 year old. There are times that actually there are situations that requires for them to do something parental to me. So it's, if I'm able at that moment to actually be on a receiving of that, then a true emotional uh, relationship has been established. Therefore nourishment happens. So it's the heart that actually needs to be nourished. That example you said about somebody who listens, uh, I've been through the abusive situations and all that, so is there any hope for me? Yes, there is. If we 
consciously put ourselves, open ourselves, which is sometimes not very hard, not very easy, because the more pain we have, the closer we are, the less we we dare to open up because of one more pain I can't take anymore. That was the very reason we initially closed because the pain was too much. So, <clears throat> but there is no other way. <laughs> and I promise that the, the, the result, the fruit, the experiences are far more rewarding because um, in one of the songs that uh, my partner and I wrote together called Home of Love, this point is, is a drop of love can actually, uh, is more powerful than a tons of pain and ache, a drop of real true love. So one true experience suddenly brings life into the being. There is hope, you know, I can do it again. <laughs> Something. Yeah, <like> that. <laughs> that's nice. There's a thought which comes to mind, which is that if, you know, if a person is sort of constricted, then there's no capacity to dissolve the hurt and the pain and so on that's there. It's like trying to take a handful of mud and drop it in a glass of water. There's really no place for it to dissolve. But if, if, the, if that constriction can somehow be relaxed and they can be kind of more ocean-like, then you, tr you drop a handful of mud in an ocean and poof, you know, it's gone. Um, and you were saying about how when we really develop, or, or rather, you were saying about how all these virtues just kind of begin to overflow and express themselves at a certain stage of our unfoldment. Um, it's, it's like, you know, we could use the analogy of we have this bank account with millions of dollars in it or something, but we d we're living on the street as a pauper because we don't have access to the bank account. <laughs> and at some point we make that connection and begin to withdraw money and, and we're no longer a pauper. But so we're all like that. We're all these multimillionaires in, in this sense. We are. Yeah. And, you know, there's that little s the phrase from the 23rd Psalm, my, my cup runneth over. It's like at a certain point the fullness just gets uh, to be full enough so that it just spontaneously overflows. Point of no return. Is that it? Yeah, it, yeah. It's like when, the, when the, that seed reached a point, I mean, it goes, I, I don't exactly know how many years does it take for apple seed to come to bear fruit. But whatever amount, during that whatever amount of time, something is happening, something is developing and maturing and maturing, bringing the point of sudden opening that the, the cup runneth over, so to speak, mm -hmm. because <clears throat> it's a point of no return. It's not possible to actually be told. A apple tree <laughs> cannot right. sell no fruit this year. <laughs> <laughs> no soup for you. <laughs> It, it happens in human being the same way exactly because uh, when when a heart reaches that point of maturity exactly like that seed when it when it has the correct uh, nourishment that is important because that even apple seed can never become an apple tree if the circumstances are not correct if there's not enough water or warmth or light or what those kind of, those are important for human being the same yeah and so one point we can possibly make um, leading toward a conclusion is that the circumstances these days are very conducive to this kind of unfoldment we've been talking about. There are so many opportunities now. You know, first of all, we don't have to like live from hand to mouth fighting for our very survival, as, as many people in the world unfortunately still do, but as, as you know, cultures throughout antiquity have had to do. We have the leisure to explore this kind of thing and to dedicate ourselves to study and practice and whatever we're drawn to do. Yeah. Um, but secondly, there's so much available by way of wisdom through the Internet, through teachers all over the place. I mean, if you have the, the motivation to pursue this, it's like, you know, kid in the candy store now these days compared to what it might have been somewhere in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And people like you. You know, the, that example that you said before about the mud and a, and a cup of water and ocean. Right. This, the more people are uh, realizing their true potential, the being, uh, their behavior towards other people will also change. Mm -hmm. So a very person who is so solidly closed uh, and is not capable of actually opening up, a lot of time that opening up happens by the continuous 
uh, uh, treatment of others exposure to others in a kind way yes yeah yeah Supposed to is somehow that hard layer becomes softened and softened because that's the power of the energy of true love, mm -hmm. a true expression of light that comes in somehow is loosened and loosened that thick crust around, and then, uh, in fact, even though the crust may not be open, but the energy of love can go through that and reach the person's essence. But sometimes the person right away doesn't open up, but it, it takes a lot more uh, nourishment in order for a trust to be established. One example that I used to use was the was a dry land, you know, a desert. You know, if you pour water in it, it goes down, and you don't see any difference. You pour more and more and more, it goes down, and, but it's not going to waste. That's the important thing. Right, it's saturating the ground. But from a bottom up. Right. So this uh, this layer of uh, children inside of us that is mostly the most hurt one, because during the childhood we don't have so much of the logic or ability to think. How does the child relate to the world? Purely through emotions only, absolute trust and innocence, and is emotion. Therefore, is the most impressionable time of all times if something is told over and over to a child it has much more possibility to make an impression it's like print in the being of the person than later on because later on you can think and analyze if somebody tells you constantly you are in a negative way so and so and so and so and so if you're a child you're much more prone to believe it after a while and that belief remains and sometimes acts and, 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 and dominates everything that we say and do. But later on, if somebody tells you so-and-so and, so and you, you think about it, no, that's not true. <laughs> you know, you can think. But the child doesn't think, doesn't have a logic. That's why that a lot of the roots of our behavior is there in that very first stage. So that's why for us it's important to to go back to that level of the childhood and it's not so easy because it's very difficult to trust that's why the crust is so thick around but the more people are kinder towards each other even a drop of love here and there it never goes to waste you know and a smile to someone a good morning to someone have a great day to someone and another smile continued by a smile it makes a difference because it injects that energy of kindness which is a virtue of love. And uh, it matters. It really does matter, even though we might not see. You know, sometimes you're driving in the middle of a highway and you're kind to someone. And uh, you anticipate that this person want to turn and you slow down instead of going fast. And then the person comes and look at you with gratitude and you look with a smile. At that moment, life happened. And you never know, maybe that person's mood change towards better someone maybe was a suicidal maybe who knows you know this all uh, i've heard actual stories like that where someone was contemplating suicide and and someone just behaved very kindly toward them and it made the difference and they changed their mind you know yeah. it matters it all matters. every 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 thought every word every action matters yeah and you know, if we if we believe in the law of karma, then <laughs> it all comes back to us too. So I mean, not that that's why we act kindly, but you know, as you sow, so shall you reap. Exactly. This is something that I realized so deeply re recently that it, it's to do with the oneness principle. Mm -hmm. If we think that we are separated from each other, then we do things towards each other not realizing you think that you did some a harm to someone but the truth is that we are connected to each other so at certain point of human history people realized that is is good to do good mm. Act, ask not for whom the bell tolls you know no man is an island and that many many centuries or thousands of years of human experience the golden rule develops in all the cultures and the yeah. philosophies and religions of the world that simply says do unto others as you like them do unto you 
if we start even applying these principles, tomorrow we're going to have far better world. Yeah. But then ultimately, I'm sorry, ultimately to that is that to realize that because of the oneness principle, whatever I do, I do to myself. You are doing it to yourself, yeah. yeah. Because we are one. And mm -hmm. that's why probably the old wisdom of whatever goes around comes around. Yeah. You, you reap what you sow. This is the meaning of because we are one, so if we live with this consciousness that whatever I do to anything, not even anyone, to anything, I'm actually doing it to myself, is a great motivation to actually do constantly good. <laughs> and I think even having that understanding helps because it's true. And if you do have the understanding, you can sort of intuit that truth to whatever degree of clarity. You know, it doesn't have to be 100% clear, but, you know, you say things like you've just said, and it... Uh, and letting the cat in, maybe. No? You stay there. Want to come in? Okay, stay there. Uh, you say things like that, and um, because it is true, it actually resonates intuitively with people. You know, there's a kind of a feeling like, yes, I know this. And, uh, you know, so anyway. This is because we have the same heart. Yeah, yeah. The energy of heart inside of us is the same. That's why it's recognizable. It's the most deepest recognizable thing, even through a look. That's how important. You're sitting in your car, somebody is parked through their, their car, and then you do an act of kindness, and you smile with your eyes even. Mm -hmm. And the, it goes to the place where it's supposed to go. It right the way recognize the act of kindness, loving expression of virtues. Because that's our very meaning. It gets instantly, like a, it absorbs it and realizes it, recognizes instantly. Yeah. Is another encouragement, as you said, to be good, to do good, <laughs> mm -hmm. to be kind. <clears throat> to use the analogy of the, the cancer cells again, you know, the cancer cells are out to, for me, 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 and they're kind of killing the host organism. But there are other cells in the body which are cut, like scavenger cells and white blood cells and so on that they just uh, they just dissolve within themselves impurities and get rid of them and and you know. And yep. <laughs> 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 You know that that's a force of good to to come and help. That's and and we all can be that. And yeah. I believe there are far more of that in the world because you know just one person in a thousand can do a loud wrong things and it seems it's showing. But the good is actually normally is not loud. It's just good and right. Yeah. So there are far more good people and good energy by far in the world and it's getting better every day <laughs> despite so yeah that's good Beautiful. alrighty well um, if people I mean I know you have little meetings in Maryland where you live and so on um, and I guess you're working on a website and you have a few videos on YouTube but if people want to get a little bit more in touch with you is there a way of doing that I mean do you talk to people over Skype or on the phone or, or what uh, yes uh, here I do that um, actually, since I started talking to you, I became more encouraged to finish the website and so on. A friend of mine recently helped me to uh, make a site on uh, Facebook. Uh -huh. There's a site on Facebook, The Way of Heart. Right. And also, if we go to thewayofheart.org, mm -hmm. connects to the YouTube uh, channels. But uh, thanks to you, we are actually developing this now non-stop. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yes, happy to put more material into this uh, site. And uh, as far as, because I want to promote mm -hmm. everything that is good, you know, in any way that I can, about books and music and movies and people and events and so on. Because, you know, like we meet every time, uh, uh, on Saturdays we meet with people and it's the, through this website Meetup. Yes. And then there is a, a, the way of heart. Oh, so it's like a webinar kind of thing. Uh, in other words, people all over the country can get on to Meetup and they can have a conversation. Are you saying that? Good. That would be good. Not yet. but That's possible. Francis Lucille does that every weekend. He has like a, a, a meetup.com webinar thing where people are seeing and hearing and talking and it's like this nationwide, worldwide kind of meeting. So you can... I, but in a larger amount of people, like people yeah. can all... Is that... Yeah, yeah. It's it's technically possible. Wonderful. I'll, I'll send you some information about it. But um, in any case... 
it's you're doing great stuff and um i will link to your website such as it is uh from batgap.com and i'm sure it'll be growing and and you know we'll see how things develop um and uh let me just make a few concluding remarks uh, for people in general. So first of all, I want to thank you very much, Meredad. This has been a delightful conversation. I'm sure we could go on another two hours. But <laughs> I don't know what our families would think about that. <laughs> uh, but uh, very enjoyable. And I really you know, hope to meet you in person one of these days and give you a big hug. Same here. <laughs> um, so uh, let me just make a few concluding remarks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to make a standard recording of this and just put it at the end of all my interviews so I don't have to make the guests sit through it every time. But for now, um, I'd like to say that you've been watching or listening to a, uh, an interview on Buddha at the Gas Pump, which is an, a weekly interview show. There's a new interview posted just about every week. And if you'd like to be notified of those, you can either subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching this on YouTube and YouTube will send you a notification or you could go to batgap.com and there's a link there for signing up for an email notification. You'll get an email whenever I post a new interview. Um, there is also a chat group on batgap.com around each interview. People get involved and start talking about the points that have been discussed in the interview, so feel free to participate in that. There's also a Yahoo group called Buddha at the Gas Pump, which is less well known, but is quite lively and active, and a bunch of people chat there. I don't read any of this stuff because I don't have the time, but, it, but it's there. <laughs> um, Very happy. Yeah. Very happy. And what else? Um, just about it. Uh, as I say, I'll be linking to Meredad's website. I, I have a donate button on, on batgap.com, which I appreciate people clicking every now and then. It pays the expenses of doing all this. It enabled me to go to the Science and Non-Duality Conference in California a few weeks ago, where I did a couple of interviews, which will be posted soon. So, thank you for listening or watching, and we'll see you next week. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks, Meredad.